mass suicide adhere to the Mayan calendar, which predicts the end of time to occur on the 21st of December of this year. This year. This year. The, uh, the, the bulk of the work uh, is, picks up basically about half the way through the Escape from L.A. sequence. Uh, we actually pick up with a nice shot uh, flying over the uh, golf course that's at the base of the Santa Monica Airport in which you see a nice big crack uh, open up and several houses and trees and whatnot fall in. Um, and then uh, basically it picks up at the airport and uh, from there that leads into the, uh, the actual collapse of the runway and the enormous fissure that opens up and kind of the flight through that. And then uh, they emerge, of course, into downtown and fly through, and eventually ends up with the uh, the last two shots, seeing California more or less sliding off into the ocean. And uh, that that chunk defines the majority of what we did. We did do a little bit uh, with Washington D.C. with some ash shots, and I think we uh, uh, we did the uh, uh, Washington Monument uh, collapsing. But uh, the vast majority of everything was in the the latter half of the Los Angeles sequence. California is going down. God, you sound like a crazy person. The governor just said we're fine now. The guy's an actor. He's reading a script. Well, mostly uh, data load. Uh, you're talking about a tremendous number of uh, buildings uh, and structures, uh, large-scale landscapes and whatnot that were crumbling. So most of this was an exercise in trying to uh, apply you know, the rigid body type techniques and, and various things uh, to just uh, very, very large-scale scenes, large numbers of buildings, uh, a lot of complexity in the buildings or other structures. Um, and then having that tied in with uh, you know, a vast array of volumetric effects, also they had to cover these very large areas. So it was uh, lots of uh, kind of planning and, and logistics in terms of uh, trying to put together so many things that had to be simmed in so many different layers. And then, of course, uh, as your later layers had to uh, depend on the previous ones, it's just that whole thing of uh, trying to organize that and keep it straight. So that's, uh, it, was, it was a lot of work. So. Hi, um, do you mind if I join you? I, there's I wanted to ask you something. Yeah, I only um, got a minute. Hey, Pickle? No. We had a, a lot of extensive previews was done on the show uh, that we received. And uh, at the, uh, that point, you had all the, the choreography they had actually planned out for when what building tips into what building or uh, various things. And so the first part of it would just be going through and trying to do blocking on our side to make sure that we had uh, gotten the director's uh, vision for the, the, the action that was going on in the scene. What were the largest structure or objects were that you were having to, to break up? Uh, those would have to go through the demolition pipeline, which uh, the, the buildings themselves were all, most of them were picked out of uh, real buildings in downtown, others were things that had been modified or uh, changed a bit, but you'd have to have the buildings built to spec so that it would work with the uh, destruction uh, chopping gizmo. Uh, that would actually break the thing up into its small pieces. It would then go through kind of an effix, uh, effects rigging process to have all the uh, joint strengths and constraints uh, that glues the building back together uh, so that it essentially remains a cohesive whole. Then you'd have to then apply whatever previous animation had been done. That would have to be applied so if a building's actually falling over, that uh, that's initially actually supplied by uh, animation that we're doing, but then selectively uh, the parts of the building are released and turned dynamic, and uh, then those things being, actually crumble and you know, look pretty. And uh, really at that point, then it's, it's really just getting those performances bought off on and getting those looking nice. And then uh, if other simulations around them, whether it's like uh, small debris and glass or the dust and volumetrics, all of those would be started on those buildings. Or if that building crashed into another one, then in a lot of cases you would then uh, sim that second building after the fact using the first one as a collision body. And uh, then again, like I say, you just kind of keep stacking these things and working downstream to actually build up all the, the layers that were necessary. A bullet is, uh, is actually a, a good part of the pipe, um, but essentially, uh, um, this is, uh, I think, becoming more common, is taking the kind of the game engine physics uh, and being able to actually bring that into one of the uh, large packages. So in this case, it was Houdini, uh, but we uh, essentially uh, wrapped up bullet uh, into a, a plug-in in Houdini and then built a pipeline around that, um, and that, that eventually ends up being uh, everything from a lot of uh, well, the, just the things that actually chop up the geometry uh, and then glue them back together, or the uh, joints and constraints, all of that is then set up to work with uh, basically how Bullet conceptualizes dynamics and uh, joins and constraints between objects. And so you, you basically end up with a series of plugins or uh, networks that, uh, that 
support the you know the basic bullet engine at that point. But that's uh, that was a big bullet was a big part of our uh, our process. In the beginning, we um, there was a phase for probably for like three months when we were unsure if we could even do this side of destruction. Um, and then that's why we went down to uh, using the uh, the bullet route. Um, but even even when we were developing it, obviously we were doing a lot of uh, development tests, the simulation tests, and it really took us like three months to even tell ourselves that, oh, maybe we can do this project with the route we, we took. So, um, yeah, there was definitely a phase where we were really scared whether we can even, you know, pull this off or not. There's usually one test that we run, which I think we happened around the third, the third month, where you know, it was a small building test that kind of fell over and it looked really uh, realistic when it fell down and it hit the ground and it kind of squashed in half. Um, that w th those are the moments where we said, oh, wait a minute, maybe we can do this project after all. I think it's the complexity of the destruction and we achieved that by um, considering the physical building structure within the model we were building. So we ran a lot of tests to try and collapse this bungalow model and to get that to look realistic, we first start with just chop the building up and let it collapse. And that looks kind of okay, but it doesn't look that realistic. And then, so what we ended up doing was like we actually made all the pillars within that uh, structure pretty close to what the physical you know, architecture would do. So we had these pillars running uh, vertically on the walls, and we had the roof supporting pillars, and these were all modeled precisely to what the real thing would do. And it would even set constraints on the wall to be a little bit stronger or the, the supporting structure to be stronger. And then you run a simulation and the roof would collapse fast because it's built that way and the, uh, the strength is weaker. So then you see some parts of the house go first, but you can tell that the, uh, the support structure is still like trying to hold on to it. So that, that kind of a detail in how we modeled it, how we constrained it, and how we rigged the, the dynamics really added to the, uh, the complexity of the simulation. We had a lot of a lot of this. Uh, we call it the Fisher. We had a lot of shots with this Fisher, and we uh, we were a little bit concerned about. You can see so far in the in the Fisher, so we were a little bit concerned about how to generate that for so many shots. And for you normally see a few miles down the Fisher, so we actually came up with a what we call a little library system, where we basically took a chunk of the of the ravine or the Fisher and pre-simulated it and then pre-simulated dust for it and, and even a few things that could fall over. And then we generate a few, a few varieties of these blocks and then we just repeated the blocks with a little bit of offset in timing and, and so down the fissure. So initially our plan was for each of these blocks we would simulate the top surface as well with the road and the buildings and, and cars. In the end we realized that um, you, it's pretty forgiving with the with the dirt kind of collapsing, but it, you could quickly see repetitive patterns. Or the director wanted specific things to fall down and add an extra house here. So after we had the fissure, we we started hand placing things that we just threw over the fissure. And because it was all free falling, they they didn't really interact that much with the with the dirt. So we could simulate them separately. The big slabs were actually modeled and hand animated and then we went in, if a big slab lifted up we would go in, the effects team went in and, and shattered the edges and just, we, we used the same kind of tools that we generated the blocks with but we would then add just crumbling on the sides of those so it was all custom made, it was only for two shots so it was a little bit of a different pipeline even though the same tools were used. As it turns out, uh, it's only visible in, or it would have been visible in one shot that actually is in the film, uh, where uh, California is sliding into the ocean. I don't think we actually crumbled the building, but unfortunately I think part of the, the plane's fuselage is actually on top of 
that area. So unfortunately, Dee Dee, uh, as far as we know, does not get uh, you know, dunked in the ocean. What I really had wanted to do, though, when Santa Monica Airport gets collapsed, there's actually a very nice restaurant that we a lot of us go to called Typhoon. And uh, it's right there on the runway. And uh, I wanted to get the building in there and destroy it uh, and put us in the windows. But unfortunately, it, it just didn't work out. We almost had Dee Dee in one of the shots, actually. It, it just went out. It, it was in there for a while, but then the camera got repositioned a little bit. So it's not in screen, unfortunately. <laughs> Ultimately, in almost everything uh, in visual effects, it's always about audience expectations. Um, typically, if you, took, if you watch the Discovery Channel or anything where they're actually going to show what a real earthquake or a real volcano or tidal wave, anything looks like, you know, normally it is, uh, sometimes it's more spectacular than you would imagine, other times it is oddly subdued or uh, subtle. And uh, typically, uh, obviously these events, uh, we only see them very, very rarely, and so the audiences typically in their minds are actually pulling off of their other experiences in life. So if, like, if you see a, a glacier shatter, you actually, your brain starts looking at, like, well, what does glass look like when it shatters? Or something that I know what it looks like when it shatters. And so uh, you then start trying to push towards what the brain is expecting. So in something like this with the, the earthquake and the buildings falling over, uh, it's, it's trying to more tap into what the audience would either expect or what the director is looking for more, like build on that and do it for something even more spectacular. Uh, but the, uh, the physics of it, you're trying as best you can to make sure that weight and mass get conserved so that your brain doesn't say that looks too light or it moves too fast. Uh, but otherwise, then it's a lot of uh, dramatic license trying to both uh, hit the audience's expectation of real and what the director is trying to push it uh, for dramatic effect. Just the fact that we had lived to tell the tale, that was a, uh, a big part of it. Uh, it was a lot of data and, uh, you know, many months in many cases uh, for the largest shots. And uh, so it was, it was almost like giving birth at that point. So uh, a tremendous sense of relief in some cases. And of course, the thing is you're so close to it when you're watching it that, uh, you know, you can't really see anything except all the flaws or things that you, you know, you'd want to change. And then you, you know, see it a few months later or something, it's like, oh, well, that's really kind of cool. So, uh, you know, it's, that's kind of the happy part is to see it after the fact and, uh, you know, Feel like okay, that was uh, that was worthwhile. It seems to me that the worst is over. Thank mm -hmm. you.